Today we get to start a brand new series. Um, I was thinking about this, and and when you read through Scripture and you read through uh, the Bible, um, there's some like just crazy stories that are in Scripture. There's some crazy stories that are in the Bible, and 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 some that are that are really hard to believe. Some that are. Uh, to me, like it's it's just very interesting, um, and, and and we have these stories. Like there's a giant fish that eats a person, and that person lives for three days, and then he gets thrown up onto the to the land and and goes. Like the story of Jonah, like it's kind of a crazy story in scripture. There's the one where the whole earth covered was covered with water, and there was a boat with a lot of animals. And they just kind of hung out. Like it, it, it's some crazy stories. One of my favorite comes out of 2 Kings chapter 2. And that is, if some of you uh, might know it, some of you might not, but Elisha had been taken over. Some teenagers were making fun of him because he was bald and he cursed them and bears came out of the wood and said, ate them. <laughs> you don't believe me? Look up 2 Kings chapter 2, I believe it is in, and there you have Elisha. And so be, be careful, students. Because that's, but it's, it's, it's these interesting stories. What about the plagues that hit Egypt? Um, you know, not to mention all this messed up stuff as you read through scripture, all the stuff that's just weird and, and sacrifices and, and like just stuff that, that turns our stomach today to hear about is the stuff that was happening back there. Actually, it's interesting because most people will come up and they'll be like, man, our world is so bad, all the bad things that are happening. And I'm like, man, those things are happening back then too, like scripture of, of incest and rape and, and child sacrifice and all of these things are happening. The difference is, is we just have it at our fingertips in front of us now because of social media and news and everything else, outlets that they didn't have. You know, if they wanted to send a text, it took someone quite a while to chisel it into that rock. <laughs> so that they could put it on something to carry, right? They didn't have that. And so, so like our world has been messed up for a long time, but there are these, these, these stories, these events that happened throughout scripture that were crazy. And we had a whole bunch of different ones we were going to. And then as I was sitting and preparing, we're just gonna stay on one story for the next four weeks. And it's the story of Balaam. And, and it's the story of Balaam and, and this guy named Balaam, he was uh, just messed up, right? It happened in Numbers chapter 22, and here's the bottom line. Here's what I want you to walk away with today from. You can't have a foot in both camps. You can't have a foot in both camps. There's a story about a guy during the Civil War that couldn't decide what side to fight for. So he wore a blue shirt and gray pants and both sides shot him. It's this idea that, that, that we, we, we like having it both ways. And to be honest, we, we kind of like this idea of, of having it both ways. And let me give you an example. If, if tomorrow you never had to go back to work, yet you still received a paycheck that, that, that would take care of all of your needs, all of your wants, and you never had to work again, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Like you would get, you would get it both ways. Like you didn't have to work, but yet you would get a paycheck it would still get deposited into your account. Like, like we like things both ways. We like it both ways. And a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to walk the line. And what do I mean? I mean, it's the line of, of on one side, you have your Christian faith. And the other side, you have a, a worldly faith. And we spend a lot of our time trying to walk as close to that line as we can. Sometimes we slip on both sides. And it's a dangerous place to walk. There, there's two things that I want to come out of, of what God's put on my heart today, and, and, and that's this. One is if, if you're living a transformed life by Jesus and, 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 and you are striving every day to, to do what God has called you to do and have the characteristics that Jesus says that we are supposed to have as Christ followers to, to, to strive to do that, I hope you're encouraged today to keep going. And if you're someone who maybe is flirting with the line a little bit, you're encouraged to stop and to really evaluate and search your heart. But what I see in, in Christianity, what I see in, in, in the church is this idea that we like to flirt with this line between where is, where is my faith in Christ and where is a, a, a faith in the world, if you may. 
you know, as a youth pastor, even as a pastor for so many years, it, it's like people ask this, asks this question, how close to sin can I get without actually going over? And if you're asking that question, you're already way too close. But we like to walk the line. For people, we got this idea of what it means to be a Christian. We like to gather in church. As long as it doesn't get too personal. As long as I'm not convicted too much or the pastor says something that that I don't like. But, But we like coming to church. Or we like small groups as long as it doesn't interfere with something else that's happening in our lives. We like it when people pray for us. You know, when life's crazy and we're going through stuff, but please don't ask me to pray. Maybe for some of us, we have our set of friends that we like to hang out with at church. And then we have a completely different set of friends that we like to hang out outside of church. And we really don't want those groups to cross-pollinate. I'll wear my Christian t-shirt, just maybe not to school. And we walk this line. And sometimes if we cross over, it's okay, because I'm not that far over. And we find ourselves living a life trying to keep a foot in each camp. Over the next few weeks, we're going to look at at this, this guy, Balaam. And we're going to look at his donkey in a few weeks and how his donkey was probably even more spiritual than Balaam was. So before Shrek was ever a, a idea in, in whoever that put it out, uh, this is the original Shrek and donkey. We're not going to get to the donkey today. I want to, I want to set the stage for who this guy named Balaam is. So this is what's happening. Numbers chapter 2, the Israelites, they escaped Egypt. They escaped the plagues. They were wandering in the desert. They were doing all these things. They had already fought um, some of the people there, and and God had given them victory over it. And they come to this, this mountain, the mountain of Moab, and they're at the edge of the promised land, which God had had promised them. And as they're sitting there, their reputation started to precede them. And if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Numbers chapter 22... Numbers chapter 22. We're going to look at a few verses here. And I can't see that. And the lights are too big, so I'm going to read it off my iPad. It said, The Israelites traveled on and camped in the plains of Moab near the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak saw all the Israelites had done to the Ammonites. Moab was terrified of the people. Because they were numerous, and Moab dreaded the Israelites. So the Moabites said to the elders of Midian, The hordes will devour everything around us, like the ox eating up the green plains in the field. So the king was scared. He was freaking out. He saw these people. He knew their reputation. He knew what was about to happen, and they were there. And, and I don't know what was going on, but, but as they were on this mountain, they could look down and see the people, and it freaked them out. So Balak, he does this. He says, as Balak was a Moab's king at the time, he sent messengers to Balaam. Balak asked him, look at the people has come out of Egypt. They've covered the surface of the land. They're living right across from me. Please come and put a curse on these people for me because they are more powerful than I am. And I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that those you bless are blessed and those you curse are cursed. And in verse seven, it says, and the elders of Moab... And the Midian departed with fees in hand. They came to Balaam and reported Balak's words to him. Now, there's some things we need to understand about Balaam. And actually, I, 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 I probably knew this at one point. As I was studying and unpacking this, I really got to understand who this guy Balaam is, right? Because Balaam, actually, his name means this, destroyer of people. Balaam's name actually means destroyer of people. And so I was thinking about this. If you wanted to call on somebody to put a curse on on your enemies to defeat them, 
Find a guy whose name is destroyer of people and find that guy and have him come because that's the perfect guy to come do this, right? It's, it's this idea that, like, that he would do this. But here's the problem. Balaam was a pagan seer. He was not an Israelite and therefore not one of God's chosen people. He was this diviner by trade. And if you're wondering what a diviner by trade would look like back then, this guy would be basically a fortune teller. He would, he would do different things like read tarot cards, which I'm not sure if they had them back there, or, or get his crystal ball out, or he would have this, this thing. Like he would use witchcraft and deceivery and all of these different things to kind of give a fortune on people. And so he would come, and he would, he would actually give this prediction of future events or, or uh, reveal occult things by supernatural natural means. He dabbled in witchcraft. Actually, if you fast forward to Joshua chapter 13, you see as they were dividing the land, Balaam gets killed. But here's the thing about Balaam. He was somewhat of a celebrity at the time. If there was daytime talk shows going on, Balaam would be the first person to sit on the couch and talk to somebody about everything that's going on. People liked Balaam. He was popular. He, he had money. He, he was well-liked amongst most of the kings and stuff. And so when things were, were needed or, or when they needed to understand something or they needed to, to get understanding, he was the dog whisperer of the time. I'm sure his Instagram account was just flowing with lots of people. And people were following him and understanding him. And people wanted to be around Balaam. They wanted to hire him. And Balak knew. And he wanted it so much for Balaam to come. To curse and to treat this gathering at the foot of his territory. You see, Balaam looks much different than the prophets of the Old Testament. Because the prophets of the Old Testament would usually give these decrees on what was going to happen if the people didn't change their ways, do something uh, that God was asking to it. And matter of fact, most of the time, because of what they said was so unpopular with the prophets, they were either beat up, imprisoned, or killed. But Balaam wasn't that way. Kings liked when Balaam came. They wanted to hear the good word from him. But there's also something very interesting about Balaam. Even though he was this sorcerer, this wizard, he also knew about the God of Israel. And he actually refers to him in, in God's covenant name and calls him Jehovah. Which means that he had to have this knowledge this, this, this immense amount of truth about the true God. He had to know things about God and understand things about God. Actually, later when we keep reading in, in other verses, like God in him, like he speaks to God and God talks back to Balaam. It's interesting. Balaam comes from about the same area that Abraham came from. There was this great deal of truth that he knew about God. And yet he drew on the occult. He drew on demonic sorcery. Balaam knew about God, but he didn't know God. So Balaam spoke like he knew God but he didn't live like he knew God. He never says anything wrong, but he really doesn't do anything right. He had the right things to say, but he didn't always have the same actions to back it up. His head was filled of things of the spirit, but his heart was filled of things from the flesh. He wanted to know the will of God, and we'll see that later on in, in Scripture and passages as the series go on, but he didn't always want to do the will of God. He wanted to die the death of the righteous, yet he did 
died the death of a fool. He allowed God to speak to his life, but not let God control his life. You see, it seems to me that there's a lot of people today in our churches that are a lot like Balaam. We like to carry the the name of Christ. We like to carry the idea of I'm a Christian, I am a Christ follower, but we don't always produce the characteristics of Christ. Oh, I like to go to church, but only when it's convenient. It's actually interesting, and, and I understand there's different reasons for People miss church, and, and, and it's okay to be gone on a Sunday, and, and I'm not trying to, to, to hurt anyone's feelings, maybe a little bit, um, not trying to dog on you too much. Um, uh, I understand there's times. I understand there's people that physically can't get out, but it's interesting because the conversation that Susan and I had this morning was, I wonder what attendance will be today because it's raining. But... There's these times that, you know what, I'll go to church but when it's convenient or, or I'll pray when it's convenient or I'll serve when it's convenient or I'll give when it's convenient. And so we find ourselves trying to walk this line between two camps. And whether we realize it or not, we like having a foot in our Christian camp and we like having a foot in our world camp. your life's been truly transformed by Jesus, and it should look different than the world. We use our mission statement that we want to help people find, follow, and be transformed by Jesus, and, and, and there's this idea that we've realized that we've had helped people come to the foot of cross, come to a saving knowledge of who Jesus is, but we haven't helped people be transformed by Jesus. And it's sad to know that there are people in churches, and it's not just our churches, it's all across, I think, maybe America and maybe even the world that, that have chosen to follow Jesus but haven't chosen to be transformed by Jesus. And we will settle for a casual Christianity other than a transformed life. We like it. We like the convenience of it. So instead of Jesus or God being our savior, our, our person that, that is our, our times of, of trouble, our, our person that is, that is, that is inside of us and, and moving us and shaping us, he becomes more like a vending machine or a sugar daddy. Let me go to him when I need something. I read this quote this week and it said, God isn't looking for a bunch of actors. He's looking for people who are sold out to his purpose and his plan. So how do we do this? How do we live a transformed life? And this is where I said, man, for, for all of us, I think there's some pieces in here that we can walk away from. And if, if, if you are living that transformed life and, and you are doing what your best to, to, to be transformed in God, I, keep going. But for some of us, I think there's some things that we need to do. And here's the first thing you can write down. Evaluate your life. Evaluate your life. At some point, you have to take a hard look of what's going on inside. There's this moment of defining the relationship. Defining the relationship. I still remember it well. Jalen and I were dating and coming home from Indiana, and I was the biggest jerk in the world because they would always get to this point of a relationship when it was getting really serious, and I would always be like, eh, I might need an out. I was a bad dude. I was, I was mean. I was horrible. You say, how could you do that to such a wonderful woman? I was young and dumb. But we had this, <laughs> that was a bad place for an amen. But we had this, this moment, and she had to have this talk for us to define the relationship. She's like, look, we're either going to make this work or we're done. And I realized, idiot, it's time to step up and do what I'm supposed to do. I think there's times in our lives that we have to really take this hard look with God and say, man, is there something I need to change? I mean, I, love, I like being around you, God, and I like being there, and I love you, but, man, am I ready to commit that deep? 
And it's easy for us because when we start to self-evaluate, usually what happens for us is we start to others evaluate. Well, I'm not as bad as them. Well, my goodness, they don't do this or they go here or they act this way or they do this. And we start to say, so I'm not as bad. And that's not what God asks us. David put it well in the Psalms when he said, search me, O God. Know my heart. Know me. See if there's anything offensive, God, in me. It's a dangerous prayer. And it's a hard prayer because pruning is one of the hardest things to do. Letting go. But one of the things that we can do best is to take a deep look into our heart and ask God to show us. We have to take times to evaluate our lives. Here's the second thing, plug into the body. Plug into the body. We need each other more than ever. And we need each other more than an hour a week on a Sunday. Over a year ago, we added tables into the sanctuary and you've probably heard me talk about this, but I'm gonna talk about it again. And one of the reasons that we felt with the staff is that we just have lost a connection with people. And I get it. Tables aren't for anyone. And I actually asked Dave if I could use him, Smith, as an illustration so I didn't have to pay him five bucks, even though he's not one of my kids. Um, but I asked him, I said, Dave, why, you and Linda don't ever sit at a table. Why? Because, um, and, and he says, well, for me, it's hard because I, I don't hear well because he's very distinguished and aged, and so he, he's, he's, he doesn't hear very well. And he says, so when I sit at a table, I don't always hear all the conversations. But he says, you know what, when I sit in a row, I can lean over to somebody and we can have conversations. One of the reasons we went to tables was we wanted to build connections that were deeper. And whether you sit at a table or sit at a row, a row our goal in Sunday services, during prayer time, during, during uh, questions at the end, or, or during moments of, of before or after services, that we create a connection that's deeper. You ask about the people that's going on around you. You find someone to, to talk to. You, you hear their stories. You hear what their requests are. You could pray, and you can, you can plug in deeper with people because we need to plug in with each other. Our world is so disconnected. We say we're connected. Oh, I have friends all over the place because I have my Facebook and I can talk to them, but we're really not connected. At some point, we have to plug into the body. I understand it's not always comfortable on Sundays, but we need connection. But that's just step one. That's like phase one. That's like the first thing. It has to go beyond that. Because as great as I love Sundays and as most connection of getting to see people, it has to go deeper than that. We need each other throughout the week. We need the body. We need to plug in. And I understand schedules are crazy and we got to get kids to hear and, and work goes long. And there's so many things that are in our life that are dividing from our time. And I know some of those are important things. But what do you think our enemy wants to do? The more that we can stay separated from the body, the easier it is for him to distract, to divide, to conquer, to hurt. We need to go deeper. We need our church family. We need people to step up and help. There's parents that, that are, are in the midst of, of raising kids. It's interesting. We stand up here on Sundays that we do dedications. And one of the things we ask is, you know, like, hey, we need the church to, to help step into the gap and help raise families because that's what a body does. And then every week I see a text from Susan that says, hey, we need help in the nursery. I get it. Not everybody does well with kids. I wish I had a big flow chart that I could show something. Because if the church actually stepped up and served like it's supposed to, you would serve like once in a while in the nursery. But given a mama 
who sits at home throughout the week and is with these kids an hour to sit and connect deeper is an amazing thing. You know, most of the people that serve on Sunday are the ones that have the kids, the ones that maybe could have some nice connection with adults. And a chance for others to plug in is because we step up and serve. One Sunday, we keep threatening this. We're going to show it up, and, and we're just going to be in, Susan and I are just going to be in the nursery. And we're just, it's going to come in, and people are going to be like, I don't know what to do. Where's, where's worship going to start? We can just live feed me into the nursery, holding babies, which is a scary thing to do. but we got to plug into the body. And when we plug into the body, we serve the body. I feel like we should pass a sign-up sheet around right now. We get involved in small groups. We plug into to life together outside. We go have meals with people. We have people in our house. You sit around a bonfire. You go to other kids. You have friends. Go to their, their kids' sporting games. We need the body, especially now more than ever. We need the body to function. Think about it this way. If your kids showed up to the table to eat and did nothing to clean up or to help, nothing to contribute around the house, nothing to do anything but just show up to the table and eat, how frustrated would you be? I wonder how frustrated God is every Sunday because his kids come to the table to eat and then peace out and go home. We gotta take time to evaluate. We gotta take time to plug into the body. The last one's this, and I'll be quick. You gotta find accountability. Who is someone that can speak into your life? Someone that can speak truth and be real with you. Not just what you want to hear, but can truly help you. We have to find accountability. And I know we don't like accountability because it can be hard sometimes. When you get called out on something, it can be hard. And what's interesting is, is most of us see the need for accountability in other parts of our lives, but just not in our Christian part of our lives. We like accountability at work or at home. We like our kids to have accountability In areas of our life, we have accountability, but we tend to stay away from it when it comes to our Christian walk. Who's the person that can speak truth to you? Who's the person that can call you out and that you listen to and take to heart what they have to say? We need those kinds of people in our lives because here's the truth is that we, I have seen far too many Balaams We like to have a foot in each camp. Like to walk the line. And like our bottom line said, you can't have a foot in each camp. I fear there's a lot of Balaams that show up on Sunday. And yeah, you might not be practicing witchcraft. But we're really not following Christ either. I think it doesn't work that way. It can't work that way. So I have some questions for you. And today I want you to take a moment and talk around your table. I want you to take a moment, maybe find someone beside you to talk to. Or if God's maybe really speaking to you, like you might just need to just self-reflect for a moment. If you see someone sitting by themselves, go talk to them. It's okay. You can move around. But I really want us to, to just talk about a few of these questions. And as we look at the life of Balaam, really reflect to say, God, does my life reflect his or does it reflect yours? Let me pray. Father God, I thank you for everything you do. I pray in this moment as we discuss, as we talk, as we kind of 
wrap up what we're learning from you today, God. That you would speak to us. God, help us to just let down our walls a little bit. Help us to be a little bit vulnerable. As we reflect on on our relationship with you. And God, today it might be for some of us that that it's just it's it's this idea that man, it's it's keep the fire going. Keep that transformation happening. For others, God, I pray that you would convict us of the areas we need to change and help us move forward. God, you've used a man like Balaam to show us how not to live, how not to try to play the world game and the Christian game, how not to walk the line. God, we pray that you would speak to us today. We thank you. We give you all the praise and honor. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen.